Uh, then following this talk, there will be an opportunity to ask for Professor Cordonia Seger questions. Uh, so please submit your questions throughout the talk using the chat function so that I can collate the submitted questions and put them uh, to Professor Cordonia Seger on your behalf following her presentation. And now, uh, Let's go to it. So I am delighted to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Marie-Claire Cordonia Seger. Uh, she's a distinguished professor, a scholar, and expert jurist in law and governance on sustainable development. She's connected to Lucy Cavendish and the University of Cambridge in many ways. She is a fellow in law and the director of studies from the LLM and MCL in our college. She also holds the Leverholm Trust Visiting Professorship across the university based in the Bennett Institute for Public Policy and as a senior co-founder and fellow of the Cambridge Centre for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Governance and the Centre for Climate Change Engagement. With a DPhil in international law from the University of Oxford, a master's in environmental law, economics and policy from the Yale University and both common and civil law degrees from McGill, she has also been leading legal research at the Law to Patch Center for International Law since the mid 90s. A senior director of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law in Montreal, Canada, a full professor of law in the University of Waterloo, an executive, executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP26 Climate Law and Governance Initiative, Professor Cordonia Seger also mentors and guides a circle of around 120 lawyers and legal researchers and serves as an advisor and chair of several international expert commissions. So fluent in six languages and two legal systems, she has served as general counsel to several UN treaty bodies and negotiations and founded several national and international organizations law journals and collaborative educational initiatives. So as you see, she's not just an academic, she also holds 20 years of international treaty negotiations and national legal reforms experience through the UN that spans over 80 countries of the Americas, Africa, Asia Pacific and the Middle East. So for these achievements among various honors this year, she was distinguished with the prestigious Weirman Tree International Justice Award so the award recognizes Professor Cordonia Seger as a founding pioneer in the field of international law and policy on sustainable development, author and editor of over 20 books and 100 studies. Uh, she's also laureate of the respected International Justitia Fundamentum Regnorum Award for her efforts to advance justice, human rights, protection of nature and the interests of future generations. So last but not least, she has helped us immensely during the challenging lockdown, hosting events such as the 2020 Online International Symposium on Human Rights, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Law, which convened 1400 plus leading experts, ministers and judges in the field, and also supporting a network of over 400 keen secondary students stranded by COVID-19 school closures by co-chairing a special online series of law, science and sustainability tutorials, among other projects. So thanks Marie Claire for finding the time to share your great work with us. I have left some things behind <laughs> about your great career for the sake of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so without further ado, I will pass you the microphone if you're ready. Thank you. Wonderful. And I understand that there is a um, PowerPoint that is being somehow magically made to appear on everyone's screens. So my talk will focus in particular on a sustainable recovery, question mark, um, <laughs> prioritizing post-pandemic law and policy innovations to achieve the UN sustainable development goals. So next slide, please. And let me just um, make sure that I've set my timing up so that we have a chance to be sure that we have um, an opportunity for questions. So we start with the understanding that I don't think many of you would contest that we are living in difficult times, facing a confluence of crises. As a scholar and international lawyer trained to assess evidence 
identify global challenges and opportunities, and then negotiate principled compromises, I have never been more concerned. Recent findings by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the World Health Organization, and other global scientific bodies highlight that humanity is reaching a critical crossroads. Rapid and dangerous climate change is exacerbating global poverty rates, undermining access to essential food sources and threatening livelihoods for thousands of people, even as our planet's ecosystems continue to degrade with nearly 1 million species already facing extinction. Even as these planetary boundaries are being exceeded, and just for clarity, in the image on the slide, if you can see, anything that is beyond the green safe zone is red, and some of the red is truly concerning. Successive waves of the COVID-19 pandemic reaching over 34.8 million cases and more than a million deaths worldwide this month are also threatening a global economic contraction of 5.2%, which will further escalate global poverty, according to the World Bank and the UN Development Programme. So as you can see on the right-hand part of the slide, we have some progress in some parts of the world toward better scores on the Human Development Index, which measures not just economic growth or gross national product, but also health, access to education, access to water, number of deaths before the age of five that were preventable. And we've still got many areas where more work is needed, but we also have made some progress recently. Next slide. As you can see, part of the worry that we receive from credible sources such as the European Commission or such as the um, Bloomberg stock market indexes is that the social and economic impacts of COVID-19 will worsen already difficult situations and trends the global challenges that we face are interlinked and increasing in severity, but they are not surprises. Complex, interconnected, wicked problems of climate change, drought and hunger, terrestrial and marine ecosystem collapse, and species extinction, also world health pandemics, among others, have been signaled by scientists and civil society leaders for decades. Across nearly 200 countries of the world, pressure is rising on already limited human, financial, and natural resources, intensifying the need for prompt and effective public policy responses, backed by legal and institutional reforms to foster rather than frustrate sustainable development globally. So as you can see on the slide, the impacts and numbers of the COVID-19 include not just full and partial lockdowns affecting over 2.7 billion workers, but also 42% of women workers forced into high risk sectors in the informal economy, 2 billion or 60% of the global workforce being also um, even more vulnerable to the impacts and 1.4 to 5 billion workers employed in sectors that are facing a severe decline. Next slide, please. And what we're seeing in the end is existing problems that we already knew about, such as the climate crisis. And when I teach climate law and policy or work with negotiators in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change circles, most of the thinking behind this isn't just about what are the next global disasters that are coming, how severe are the storms where they never used to be before, how quickly are the poles south and north and the glaciers 
which store most of the world's water starting to melt? How quickly are the coral reefs bleaching? How quickly are the wetlands drying out? It's become more of a question of on this map, the red zones being the zones that are changing, the blue zones being the zones, blue and purple zones being the ones that are flooding. Where does your family live? Next slide, please. At the same time, we're watching our decisions and our development choices costing us 90% of the world's corals, which are, of course, nurseries for the world's biodiversity in the oceans. We're also looking at losses of considerable degrees in the areas where biodiversity is most fragile and species are most rare we're indeed facing over a million species that may be gone forever very soon. Next slide, please. And finally, while the sh number of people in extreme poverty has fallen from nearly 1.9 billion in 1990 to 650 million in 2018, recent estimates are indicating that between 68 to 132 million people could be pushed back into extreme poverty by 2030 because of the multiple impacts of climate change, biodiversity loss, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Even as we watch this happen, unsafe water is costing us millions of, over a million deaths a year. And we're struggling to ensure that 2.1 billion, 29% of the world, can still get access to safe drinking water. These crises are interrelated. Next slide, please. The solutions to the crisis are also interrelated. We're facing a pandemic of global catastrophic proportions, but complex interconnected wicked problems like global hunger, climate change and species extinction and health pandemics have actually been signaled as a risk, a threat by scientists and civil society leaders for decades. They're not surprises to us. The global trends are increasing pressure on already limited natural, human and financial resources across countries, intensifying the need for prompt, effective public policy responses backed by binding legal and institutional change if we want to be able to foster rather than frustrate global sustainable development. Next slide, please. But what is important to realize, of course, is that, well, frankly, these problems, because they are not surprises, have also been subject to many very concentrated efforts for solutions. Countries have been struggling to find solutions for decades through a series of international events and programs of action, including the 1992 UN Conference on Environment and Development, the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development, and the 2012 UN Conference on Sustainable Development, as well as in 2000, the adoption of the Millennium Development Goals which replaced, became the Sustainable Development Goals of 2015. And these 17 interlinked Sustainable Development Goals are applicable to all countries. None of the 200 or so UN member states have got the answers figured out yet. But what we do have is a set of aspirations, a set of targets that support those aspirations. These targets range in groups. They're part of a new cooperation agenda towards 2030, and they can be clustered. Under the 17 SDGs are 169 key targets covering areas of public policy from poverty, hunger, health, education, and gender equality to water, energy, employment, infrastructure, cities, production and consumption patterns, climate change, 
biodiversity, oceans, and also justice and establishing global partnerships for action. As a development agenda for the global community, the SDGs provide a common framework for understanding and prioritizing domestic action aligned under a global set of priorities. And they facilitate cooperation as a succinct set of public policy priorities for international organizations, countries, and all stakeholders, including universities, to unite behind. Of course, as detractors underline, each SDG is aspirational, strictly non-binding in nature. The sustainable development goals of the world are not, however, in any way, legally irrelevant. Indeed, the very opposite is true. Each of the 17 sustainable development goals, our new research is showing, establishes common targets that are backed by the principles of international law itself, as well as many, not just one, binding international treaties. So for example, Sustainable Development Goal 7, Affordable and Clean Energy, is not only supported by the Charter of the International Renewable Energy Agency, but also by the Energy Charter Treaty, and indeed commitments to support and prioritize and incentivize new renewable energy resources and investments in myriad international trade and investment agreements these days. Sustainable Development Goal 13, Climate Action, is backed, as it says in the goals themselves, by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, also by the Paris Agreement that was signed in 2015, and by many binding bilateral and regional scientific collaboration agreements, as well as contracts that establish carbon offsets, where one country will, for example, reforest in order to provide credits against the binding target to another. Next slide, please. So what we can see in this particular area from the research that we're now doing is that there might be glimmerings of hope, opportunities to move forward in this area. And in particular, what we are facing at the moment is indeed a bit of a question mark. You see, the reason that we haven't been able to meet these binding commitments in, for example, climate change and clean energy provision has been due to three seemingly impossible barriers, gaping chasms that make forward progress impossible. Put very simply, we lack resources, we lack creativity, and we lack capacity. So starting with the need for human and financial resources, Achievement of the 169 SDG targets has been estimated by the UN to require an investment of three to four trillion US dollars per year, about probably two to three trillion pounds in developing countries alone, simply to pay for basic infrastructure, food security, health and education, and climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. A recent study actually suggests that the total investment gap just for the least developed countries, the bottom billion, is closer to 920 billion, so 700 billion pounds. These are the same gaps for which, treaty by treaty, international leaders have been signaling that we don't have the funds to meet our binding international obligations for years, as we struggle to try to bring countries together to cooperate, some that are facing the poverty, the water scarcity, the desertification, the climate impact that I pointed to in the beginning, and others that might be able to help. In the context of post-pandemic recovery, achieving the sustainable development goals offers broad benefits for health and well-being, restoring and creating new livelihoods for millions. As countries consider new economic stimulus measures, financing of millions or even billions of pounds to help their economies and the world recovery from the global COVID-19 pandemic, what better priorities to be financing? 
our research is based on the premise that the world's sustainable development goals are the global investment opportunity of a millennium. And this is a serious invitation. Scientific thresholds are shattering and we stand now at a crossroads. Fortunately, our research is also showing that not all decision makers, not all leaders in the many areas of policy and fields of endeavor are turning away from the opportunity. Indeed, examples are emerging all over the world of the kind of post-pandemic investment measures necessary. We were pointing just a second ago to the need to invest in climate action and clean energy. The Sustainable Development Goal targets that have been set globally include by 2030 to ensure universal access to affordable, reliable and modern energy services, or to increase substantially the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. Under the climate targets, we include strength and resilience and adaptive capacity in climate related hazards and natural disasters in all countries to integrate climate change measures into all our national policy strategies and planning. These non binding targets are backed by protocols and energy charter treaties to promote energy efficiency policies and to establish appropriate legal and regulatory frameworks. They're also backed by the Paris Agreement itself, holding temperature rise, Article 4.1, to the 1.5 degrees that we have to strive to, two degrees in the maximum. And yes, I'm slightly shifting the goalposts there after spending enough time with small island developing states. Post-pandemic measures that we're starting to see being announced include everything from our wonderful Prime Minister recently committing millions of pounds toward offshore wind, Lithuania, a much smaller country, dedicating 44 million GBP for co-financing of climate-related investments, and Finland increasing capitalization of the National Climate Fund by 300 million euros. Next slide, please. In a second cluster of crisis and opportunity, we have sustainable development goal two, zero hunger, to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, promoting sustainable agriculture. And again, just in case we think they're aspirational only, we have requirements under the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, Articles 5 to 7, Article 10, which obligates the parties to cooperate, to conserve and make available for sustainable use, seeds for research, breeding and food-based development under a multi-level system of access and benefit sharing. And of course, on the terrestrial biodiversity side, particularly the work that is being done right now to start to halt or at least slow species extinction. Not only do we have goal 15, life on land, to protect, restore and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. But we also have the binding convention on biological diversity. We have the convention on migratory species. We have the convention on international trade in endangered species of flora and fauna. We have the Ramsar convention on wetlands of international importance. Next slide, please. And if we accept these targets that have been set under the food security SDG and under the biodiversity restoration and conservation SDG, and we also accept the treaty obligations that exist not just in human rights law to guarantee access to food and an adequate standard of living, especially adequate nutritious food under the Convention on the Rights of the Child for Children. And we also accept our binding obligations toward cooperation for the conservation of biological diversity, the sustainable use of its components and fair and equitable sharing of the benefits from the use of genetic resources. We can also look across the post-pandemic measures that are being adopted. And we can find some examples, which may be worthy of further study. The Gambia, tiny country, 
spending 12.2 million pounds on a national food program that's going to be trying to reach 84% of households. Ethiopia dedicating 490 million pounds for emergency food distribution and 11.5 million specifically for vulnerable individuals. Germany integrating 700 million euros for forest conservation and management into their recovery stimulus. New Zealand announcing a 1.1 billion dollar New Zealand dollar program to create 11,000 jobs through investments in restoration of wetlands and riverbanks and the removal of the endangered species, the, the invasive species that are going to cost us the endemic species that are so vulnerable and rare. Next slide, please. Finally, as our third cluster for tonight, we have a set of obligations, especially from the International Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights, which support the SDG3, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And we also have a set of human rights, including from the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all which is of course, Sustainable Development Goal 6. Next slide, please. This means that what we're looking to do is to invest in health and access to water and sanitation. The SDG targets on health include ending communicable diseases, reducing by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases. And SDG 6.1, universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water, access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all. This is backed by treaty obligations, particularly in the international human rights world, obligations that we've never been able to find the money to actually invest in. Yet we're seeing with the post-pandemic measures, Zimbabwe putting 243, nearly 244,000 pounds to increase access to water and sanitation facilities. We're seeing temporary suspensions, offsets, and reductions in the costs of water and electricity being adopted in countries as diverse as Bahrain, Bolivia, Botswana, the DRC, Gabon, Guyana, Mali, Peru, Samoa, Senegal, Timor-Leste, and Togo. Next slide, please. The question mark I can't help seeing that is guiding most of this research now, and this is just the beginnings of a larger research project, is twofold. The first, obviously, is that I mentioned three essential gaps. We lack the resources. We also lack the creativity. And we lack the capacity. So if the resources are there now, we have governments who can choose if they're going to put their economic stimulus measures, their post-COVID recovery into supporting new Trans-Canada oil pipelines or offshore wind and solar. The big question becomes, what are we doing on the creativity and the capacity? How are we going to make sure if we're able through a creative mix of post COVID-19 public and private investments to set the necessary resources in place to address the other barriers, the creativity and the capacity chasm. This is where I'd like to conclude tonight because I see a set of institutions globally that have a role there. Awareness, knowledge, and understanding supported by research, new skills development, and above all, by quality education are needed to advance achievement of each SDG, all 169 targets, as well as to prepare future generations to be ever more resilient and resolute in the face of the impacts that centuries of unsustainable development have already set in motion. In Europe alone, nearly two, maybe 4.8 million students graduate each year from colleges and universities. The UK graduated in the last numbers, 2017, I think, 784,000 newly qualified students. 
So how do we open opportunities for as many as possible of these brilliant, newly capable graduates to turn their careers toward achieving any of these 17 SDGs so that we can build back better or indeed build forward? Our challenge and our opportunity as researchers, educators, and also, frankly, advisors across all fields who, especially during a crisis, must be ready to speak truth to power, is not to turn away. We're already seeing many new initiatives, including one being taken here in the University of Cambridge with Cambridge Zero, to inform and influence and advise government on opportunities to put their economic stimulus package right where their binding treaty obligation up to now unfinanced, and their sustainable development goals for the world are. To me, this commitment, this creativity and research and willingness to advise, and this courage to prepare our graduates to look for careers in the areas where we most need people to make a difference, is frankly the largest cause for action and therefore also for hope. Thank you. Um, thanks, Marie Claire. <laughs> I think, let's see, I have a couple of questions <laughs> just in case um, we don't have many around here. I can go for throwing all my list of questions, <laughs> but um, I, I see yeah, I see a question here by um, Simon Baudouin. Um, so how global governance is changing in the face of global environmental challenges? That's a wonderful question. And actually it's the subject of some of the research I've been doing over the years, but also the work I've done as a general counsel for different UN treaty bodies. And I think there are three ways that I can highlight, and they have to do also with the solutions and the ways that researchers and others who are working in this area can actually engage and maybe make more of a difference faster, which from the presentation, I hope it would be clear enough that I sort of believe is necessary. And, and in particular, what I would highlight is that global governance is changing in the way that it decentralizes and decisions are made at all different levels, sometimes contradictory, sometimes overlapping, sometimes complementary. But rather than, well, to be honest, a few hundred years ago, a few rich men making the decisions as kings, not literate men, most of them had advisors who knew how to read and write, rather than a history that is being shaped by a few powerful individuals, we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of educated, literate people with knowledge of all kinds, including traditional knowledge, that is valuable and that shapes the decisions that they make. And so what we see is municipalities making choices on which bus fleets to buy, having just as much impact as government declarations of national policy. And what we see is cooperation across boundaries between jurisdictions, provinces or states or cantons that are on either side of a border but share a common wetland, having more impact than possibly even the decisions of an entire group of leaders in a capital city. And that multi-leveled global governance is part of what I can see changing. Alongside, I see more science available faster to more people. And that's stacking with and becoming important to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people getting involved through public participation and transparency mechanisms. So that voices are being heard that before would have been just easily disregarded or left outside. They're not always comfortable voices for anyone. And that's something we're going to get used to because I don't think that those doors having opened will be easily closed. And what we can then also see is a willingness of decision makers 
faced with this increasingly educated, increasingly informed, increasingly angry public, trying to bring more people on side with their ideas. On the horrible side, that results in increased populism and all of the borders and barriers that go with those types of arguments and those ways of thinking. You know, we don't even realize it, but sometimes we fall into that ourselves. Oh, you know, those people are other. One child in five dying before they reach the age of three isn't as relevant as the poor people in our own country who are losing their train system because not enough people are taking the train. We need to focus at home first. I think once we start looking at the numbers and once we start understanding the impacts of our economy on everyone, that starts to change. And one of the things that I'm very much hoping to see happen, it fits under the creativity question mark, is that we assess and consider what sorts of measures our governments are saying will result in increased economic activity, better building back. And as universities, we be ready to question and to consider and to align. It's not rocket science to look at an economic stimulus package and to analyze what is in it the same way we analyze a national budget or a trade and investment liberalization proposal and see whether it aligns to our world's sustainable development goals, both for the partners in the countries that we're proposing to collaborate with, as well as for our own people, or whether it takes us in the wrong direction. And the ability of across the world, governments and others to start using those impact assessment whether it be sustainability impact assessment methodology or whether it be a um, scientific review panel or whether it be a public participation process and consultation process that is informed by and bound by prior informed consent obligations. All of these changes in global governance then also help us to respond more quickly to environmental challenges. So what we're starting to see now is not only citizens groups having a greater voice, not only the business community, the many, many, many different types of businesses that are out there having a greater voice, but also an increased willingness to assess and review and compare and try to make decisions based on evidence and try to pressure for the right decisions based on evidence. You know, I don't see the children's climate strikes, and I've said this before, as anything extraordinary. I see those kids out there implementing the Paris Agreement. We promised in Paris that we would keep an eye on what the commitments were being made by government, see if they were enough, and if not, raise cane. We would put in place the most effective public pressure we possibly can. It's a sad state of the world when it's 11 year olds out there on the street having to do that work. But it's also a change in global governance that we require to be able to achieve the objectives that we have already set in the Paris Agreement. And by the way, past 1.5 degrees, the science is now telling us we're facing global ecosystems collapse. Two degrees warming isn't even an option anymore. And our most recent calculations show that the business as usual scenario, even with all of the changes post COVID, takes us to 3.6, nearly more than double what we need. Okay. So there are a couple more questions, I think. So <laughs> I think mine will have to wait. Because uh, actually some of them were related to kind of that sort of decision um, making, you know, based on evidence and how, again, like in these complex systems, how we can somehow have a number, like a quantitative way. But anyway, let's 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 see what's what's going on in here on the chat. Uh, so uh, from Stephen Day. Hi, Steve. <laughs> 
he's a great friend of mine. Um, how much do you think that some of the institutions you mentioned as having the potential to play a key role in achieving the goals are actually impeding progress? For example, universities, most don't yet have a Cambridge Zero. Most courses didn't yet incorporate any form of sustainability he'd suggest, and many courses still seem stuck in the old paradi paradigm, paradigm, sorry. Many businesses or economics degrees, uh, for example, still fail to incorporate global goal thinking. How can universities transform or at least improve their offer? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And, and, and it's the question that actually we're trying to address at the same time as we research which measures to respond to the pandemic all over the world are resulting in a different kind of investment on the public side. We want to be able to track the private investment as well. And we want to be able to track the intellectual capital, the human capital that is going toward the SDGs versus away from it. Uh, I agree completely with what Stephen's actually implying here. Um, I remember a couple of years ago um, being informed under no uncertain terms that in Cambridge even, and this was just as we were launching Cambridge Zero, um, I, you know, students will go through engineering and the first three years they'll know every single piece of a combustion, an internal combustion engine. It's only in year four that they finally start looking at renewable energy. And that is, as Stephen Toop said when he found out about it, disgraceful. So the question that we're really asking ourselves is how fast can universities change to update our curriculum to deal with the new problems we're facing and to deal with the goals that the world has agreed. A sustainable development solutions network has been set up. Jeff Sachs and lots of other people are involved. I guess I've done a little bit of work on it as well. And 39 different countries have formed networks of universities that are making a commitment to transform as quickly as they can um, not just their teaching, but also their research toward achieving the SDGs. If you actually look across the SDGs, the, the, there, there are some images that Freedom and I can show you later if you're interested. They cover almost all areas of government policy. I mean, you should be able to point to a ministry for each of those 16. And partnerships, of course, is global cooperation. It's, you know, DFID and um, Global Affairs Canada, CEDA, and all of those parts of the work. So in a way, what we're saying is these are the areas in which humanity needs to move. These are the problems that we need to solve to improve things for everybody. I teach the Sustainable Development Goals in three universities, including here at Cambridge, um, with the Masters of Public Policy. But it's one thing to teach, you know, what are the SDGs writ broad and what are some of the changes we need to put in place? What are the laws and policies on my side to... Um, encourage them, or at the very least, you know, not impede them. And it's another thing to incorporate and look into those targets, those 169 targets for each field. You know, if we say for engineering, we've got these targets on infrastructure and innovation, we've got these targets on water, we've got these targets on um, energy, we've got these targets on um, a new form of low carbon or carbon negative development. That's a challenge that any engineer can get their teeth into. And engin any engineering department and professor can too. If we say for um, uh, our colleagues in the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, which unites a whole set of departments, we accept that addressing the biodiversity crisis, is, biodiversity emergency is one of the most important things we could be doing right now. What can you teach? What can you um, research that would help us to do that? I think most academics would reply with a, oh, thank goodness you're finally listening. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not like there's no work going on. Mm -hmm. It's rather that we haven't aligned and we still haven't managed to most clearly ensure that our universities are feeding our policy and our science is informing our decisions. And, and I, I agree with Stephen that business, economics, those are areas that are particularly important to work with and, and to help 
I guess management, yeah, managerial positions. Uh, like as you're saying, right? Like I hope our kids somehow will be those managers of the future, having gone through that education covering um, the SDGs and, and and how they align to to policies, and and they'll be they'll be able to to make the right decisions somehow, right? I guess it's just like also a matter of, of yeah, as, as you said, kind of how fast we can incorporate those things in, in the different curriculum. And, and, and it, it also has to do with listening to our students and, and, and set, creating the frameworks for them to think about what they really want and need. You know, one of the things I always talk to my students about is, you know, do you really think you're only gonna have one job when you live here that you're <laughs> going to stay in for the rest of your life? Like it, how realistic is that? So why not choose a whole career rather than just a job? And, and, and why not pick a career that aligns with one or several of these SDGs? So you know you're making a difference on priorities that the whole world has identified as important for your generation. You know, and, and it's amazing because some of them might leave university and start a new biomedical firm that will help to achieve SDG three on health, SDG nine on innovation, and SDG you know um, uh, fifteen on um, uh, biodiversity, fourteen and fifteen if it's if it's marine and terrestrial, and and that's absolutely brilliant. It doesn't all have to be by going to work in a factory somewhere. And this isn't just the knowledge economy here. This is also the change that is taking place worldwide. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine. When I was in school, we didn't yet have laptops. And um, my school's graphic arts program had the first sort of little Apple Macintosh squarey things that would align text so that it was justified so it could make a newspaper column, mm -hmm. right? And, and that didn't come in until, you know, year 11. We were still learning how to type on typewriters in year 10. So, if you sort of think about that transition over just three decades, probably closer to, yeah, it is three. It'll soon be four. Um, what, what, what you can see right away is that the access to information and the ability to make one's voice heard has exponentially increased. And I don't think it's going to, you know, that horse has left the barn. I don't think it's going to be reversed because of COVID. The more people not sitting in traffic and working from home means that more voices are out there, more solutions are being offered, more action might be taken. So if we started as universities preparing our graduates for that, for, you know, yeah, most of my career has been spent working on, you know, access to water for people worldwide. And that breaks down into all the targets but it's a pretty good life you've just described. Definitely. That's actually, yeah, let's see this, probably the last question of the day. Um, so from David Matthias. Uh, so beyond the treaty law underpinning the SDGs, what role do you see for all the forms of law or legal instrument in the implementation of the SDGs? And how do you think about litigation or regulatory law or the common law in provoking change? Oh, I'm just so glad you asked that question because the next step of our research, which we're only just starting now, is what kind of domestic regulatory regimes and what kind of legal changes are going to either provide a solid foundation for the new investments or hinder them and sabotage them, essentially. I mean, I've spent most of my life researching what law, international and also local, um, can do to either foster or frustrate sustainable development. And I will tell you very honestly, law hasn't often been on the right side of this equation. You know, in the balance, we're only just starting to shift it toward law helping to foster, if you will. So one of the strong aspects of the side of this research that is particularly important, one of the, the, the strong aspects of our work is to say, all right, let's look not just at the funds that are being made available, the economic stimulus measures that are being made available, 
the you know cancellation of fees or taxes or the um, you know um, uh, the attempts that are being made to ease the economic burden on people. Let's also look at what is the regulatory framework that's underpinning those changes, because often it's those regulations. It's whether a river has standing to sue when it's been polluted because a company stopped investing in pollution abatement technology, or it's whether a group of people are able to call attention to a change in the forest code, which will allow companies to go into areas that are meant to be for low intensity use, such as wildcrafting or tourism values, whether those changes to the forestry code can be caught and stopped in time, identified caught and stopped in time. What we're seeing right now in terms of just one area, climate change, is that there are streams of work going on. Um, yeah, the Paris Agreement sets a framework and a set of global goals that is very important, at least that it removes the, you know, sort of standard, what used to be the standard um, excuse of, well, governments can't even agree, so how am I going to be able to do anything? But we're also seeing, you know, inside judges starting to learn more about climate change and waiting for those cases to arrive in their courtrooms. We're seeing litigators starting to take those cases to the courtrooms and, and challenging decisions that are being made that aren't based on the best available scientific evidence and won't get us where we need to get in terms of our climate targets. And we're also seeing um, regulations even at the very sort of local municipal level, you know, whether, whether taxis are allowed into the city center um, when they're not yet electric or whether, um, government decision makers are permitted to approve new developments that aren't going to result in carbon neutral buildings or carbon negative buildings, even though those buildings will be around for the next 50 years because they're brand new and they're built on green space. That is a set of questions that at all levels involves legal change. And, and it's one of the reasons that often when I speak to students who are going to specialize in tax law, are going to specialize in corporate law, are going to specialize in um, environmental law, are going to specialize in, in human rights law. I don't say, um, you know, oh, um, no, come and work on climate law instead. I say, yeah, get really good at tax law and then help us draft the carbon tax that will work. <laughs> that makes right? sense. Yeah, yeah. So. I guess that's more of a holistic approach. So definitely, yeah, I, I think, again, because I'm more in the kind of technical side of things, uh, I see this, this as being a very, very complex problem with many, many inputs uh, and a tiny change in one of those could, could completely change the outputs, right? So I think, again, it's just like having that sort of holistic approach in which you have people just working, you know, coming from, from an, what seems to be a different uh, role and just having a saying in, um, in, in, in the whole picture. I think that's, that's what it's going to bring also change in this in this very complex situation <laughs> mm -hmm. so so it's great having people like you working on uh, on on pushing the boundaries of governance and law um towards uh sdgs uh yeah so so it's it's just great uh it's been lovely having you i think some people are now asking uh, questions. I don't know how you feel about maybe five more minutes or I don't know whether you have to run. I know you're really busy. So shall I go for the last question maybe? Of and course. Then, and then uh, just telling everyone, please feel free to, to send questions. Um, I guess you can do to college uh, and then we can try and pass them uh, to, to the professor. Um, but yeah, let's go for the, for the last one then. So uh, from uh, Monica Waters, so will the implementation of international law relating to human rights and development conflict with, um, with and restrict international efforts to sustain biodiversity and the rights of other animals, plants to thrive? Mm -hmm. I, I actually deal with this every day. My research institute, um, which is based in Montreal, Canada, but has a lot of um, uh, subsidiaries and collaborators in, in, in Cambridge and in Kenya and in Chile and many other countries, um, we're made up of one third human rights lawyers, one third economic lawyers and one third environmental lawyers. So I find myself, you know, with 120 lawyers trying to do a lot of 
<laughs> helping people to hear each other speak and, and, and understand what might be able to work forward and, and where are those areas of intersection which, which might actually result in, in, in sustainable development, right? In economic development that is socially and environmentally sound, that respects human rights as well as conservation imperatives. And I think that human rights and development to try to implement our international commitments in those areas in a way that would take away the variability of other species to exist is an incredibly impoverished view of human rights and development because it, it assumes that humans can live without nature, that humans can live without the natural resources, that the most poor, whose rights are most often violated, are depending on more than anyone. So, so I always try with our human rights lawyers and our environmental lawyers to say, look, you know, you care about that single human child. You care about, you know, half the world's population that are women that don't have opportunities that men have. You care about indigenous people's rights, collective rights, traditional knowledge being violated. And that is important. How can we ensure that those people have enough to not just meet their needs, but to thrive and to flourish and to feel like they're contributing to a world that they want to live in without costing the very existence of the life support systems that we depend on. And if it's, if it's phrased that way, where, where it's not, you know, everyone has a right to three cars and 12 televisions, but rather it's everyone has a right to a life that is with dignity, that is with basic needs provided, that is with children secure and, and having access to education, including CRC, education that is appropriate to their environment, education about their own nature. That gives a different conception of not just what it means to be human, but also what it means to be part of a system. And one of the things we're seeing over and over again now, I mean, I'm, I'm rapporteur of an international law association experts group on um, uh, the role of international law in the um, uh, our understanding of sovereignty has to evolve with the science. And the more that we can see that an underground aquifer is actually under six different countries and efforts of one of those countries to extract will affect the water available for all others, or that a river passes through six states and that the collapse of the ecosystem in one will result in dead water arriving in the next and that even living systems like soil and forests and grasslands and wetlands, they depend not just on each other through networks that we barely understand across borders, but also on the humans that are part of those systems and have been for generations. It becomes more a question of what kind of development and, and, and rights to what. And at the same time, it also becomes a question of how far have we already pushed things? How close are we to collapse? And, and I think those are the wicked problems. You know, those are the ones that uh, we're not joking when we say we could take all your economic stimulus package and throw it at that problem. And we'd only be, you know, a third of a way toward a solution. But fortunately, just as humans have created many of these problems, it's also human systems that can change to then solve them. And I do think that's the vision underlying the SDGs. One of the most important things about the SDGs is that they are global. No country has got it figured out. You know, some countries are ahead in one thing, but even further behind in others. Sustainable consumption and production is one of the SDGs. Guess which countries are doing well on that one? Not your usual Northern bandits, eh? So it, it is worth sort of unpacking the, the conflicts that we used to believe existed, because sometimes there are interests behind those concepts that, that, that aren't being as, as clear about what their real point is. 
you know, um, if we say um, that poor person doesn't understand that by cutting down that tree, he's hurting global climate change. We're kind of assuming that that poor person doesn't actually depend on the entire ecosystem he's living in, including that tree and all the others, and, and can name exactly where they are and what kind of fruit they have, and, and, and is trying desperately to keep the system alive while the storms pass overhead and the river dries up and the city gets closer every year. And, and, and we're maybe not giving that poor person enough credit for knowing what it is that actually needs to be done, um, not just for their own human rights, but also for their understanding of development. You know, and, and, and new research is showing that our ideas of what development means really need some updating. <laughs> <laughs> um, television shows like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous being beamed to 129 countries don't help. <laughs> Speaking of disgraceful. I see. No, it's, um, I was going to say, I find, well, I, I found the whole uh, talk and especially your um, replies to the questions really inspiring. And I think with this last bit, especially, we can see how how we have the power as individuals to to somehow have a say in and change things and and you know understanding our um, the same environment also and, and and trying to to get better information about it uh, will also help us in in having a again um, in in having at least um, an idea to to somehow push better decisions uh, at a higher level. So, so as you said, um, we're lacking that sort of creativity and capacity. Uh, let's hope we can build on that uh, with, again, networks as the ones that you've been building. Uh, again, I think we're very privileged being in Cambridge um, where people like you um, have a bit, the opportunity kind of to build all those things. Um, and again, so, so yeah, so I think with this, we should be finishing. Uh, Thanks, Marie Claire, for your time. Um, again, if people have more questions, please um, just try to make them uh, reach college and we'll try to pass them on uh, Marie Claire. And I think this is it. I hope you found this talk as inspiring as, as I have. And uh, thank you very much. I hope to see you all in the next Life from Lucy series. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.